Frank Chile is a man uh, who is, first of all, a friend of George's, and Frank has been on the program, I believe, twice before, he told some extraordinary stories about a series of UFO sightings that he was involved with. Uh, we're not going to talk about those tonight. You can hear those in the archives. Just go back and listen to George, and you'll hear Frank's remarkable descriptions and experiences. We're going to talk about uh, what they call the old days, the 1950s and 60s, especially the 50s when George Van Tassel at Giant Rock uh, was a, a big thing, George Adamski, uh, who uh, claims to have been involved as a contactee very heavily and used to lift up his shirt and occasionally would show people his, his navel, his belly button, which had very strange uh, emanating streaks from it. It was, it was bizarre. I don't know how to describe it, but uh, he was a very interesting man, George. And uh, we had back then a paradigm of contactees, not so much abductees. That came a little bit later. But certainly contactees have been around forever and abductees as well. But the 1950s and early 60s were the days of the contactee. And there was a, a name that is in that basket, along with George Adamski, George Van Tassel, and, and so many others. It's called Valiant Thor. Valiant Thor. Valiant Thor has become, over the decades, a, a conspiracy theorist's delight and is often referred to by skeptics as an urban legend. Well, what was it? Well, we're going to find out a little bit more about that with uh, with Frank right now. Frank, can you hear me all right? Perfectly clear. Good morning, Jeff. How are you this morning? Fine, thank you for asking. And you, sir? I'm doing very, very well. Well, you and George are on some really interesting uh, subjects in the last half hour, and, and, and you are indeed correct. It's a pleasure and a joy to know George. We've had a very oh, interesting yeah. conversation. George is uh, a special guy. Indeed he is. Uh, there is only one... George Filer, and they don't get any nicer. Okay. Jeff, uh, thanks, you guys. Right. <laughs> I talked a little bit about uh, Valiant Thor. Uh, there's been recently a development that occurred, an individual who's been a close friend of mine, who I've known for 45 years, has approached me about uh, an experience he had in the service regarding the disclosure of UFOs that uh, he said he wants to go public with now, and I'm working with him to try to get it into George's uh, filer's files, but I'd like to share it with you and your audience for the first time. Oh, wonderful. Well, I look forward to that. Go right ahead, please. Well, I'm going to use the name of Sam, and Sam was uh, in the Air Force, and he was at a military facility in Texas, and the base commander called all the personnel to the air, and they gave them a presentation. It had to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the commander said, what you're about to see is something that you may encounter during your term of service in the Air Force. We don't want you to talk about it. We know about it, but we want you to see this. Okay. So from 8, 8 a.m. till noontime, the theater showed a series of motion picture footage, 35 millimeter stills, um, black and white and color photographs of ships that had been taken by uh, pilots, uh, gun camera footage uh, from the Second World War all the way up through the 50s and early 60s. Now, this this person was in service in 1963, so he was completely blown away by seeing all this footage of discs, uh -huh. oh, yeah. ground discs. They were uh, cigar-shaped. Some of them were triangular ones. Uh -huh. He said they moved at astounding speeds. He said the uh, shape of them was something that was not anything that he was familiar with. And he said everybody was just found at watching this for four hours. And I said to him, I said, Sam, what kinds of ships did you see? I said, did you see more than one ship in some of the, the clips? He said, Frank, in some of the clips there were seven, six ships, and they were doing all kinds of maneuvers. But the clarity of them was so good that you could make out remarkable um, uh, details on them. So they broke at lunch for an mm -hmm. hour, and mm -hmm. he said it was so strange during that one-hour lunch. Uh -huh. He said it was like everybody was in a hypnotic state. Nobody oh, they were in, sh in shock. Sure. 
in shock, in yeah. shock. After lunch, they went back up four hours from one to five, seeing more footage, and he said a lot of them were over again, but he said there was an extraordinary number of them taken around naval ships. And he said the ones around naval ships were around aircraft carriers, battleships, uh-huh. destroyers, uh-huh. Yeah. submarines. And he said they were just remarkable-looking uh, images. And he said at the end of the, uh, uh, the afternoon session, the base commander came up onto the stage and said, uh, what you see we know all about. There was an incident that occurred in the late 40s where a craft had uh, crashed, and there were uh, three beings on the two of the beings died, and one of them survived, and the being and the craft was taken to another military base. And he said, we do not want you to talk about this. We want you to be aware of it, but don't come to us with stories of something that you've seen, because we know all about it. He also had some experiences thereafter when he got out of the service, but I wanted to revisit that again. He said some of the images that he was shown in this movie theater on base, the craft was larger than the naval vessels. They were yes. this enormous craft. Right. And he said uh, the um, there was no mistaking that just as a, like a light in the sky, he said these were close-ups of these craft either over land or interacting with uh, planes or interacting flying over uh, naval vessels. And he said that he never spoke about it again with any of the members of the base when he got out of the service, he told me that he had three experiences. He lives in North Carolina. He still lives there now. He lives on the edge of the Cherokee National Forest. And he told me one of the incidences were about 15 years ago, he was walking on a um, summer night, and he said it was in August, and he said there was no moon. And he said he looked up into the sky, and he saw this enormous white light. He said it looked to be maybe of a dime held at arm's distance, and he said it came down from the sky, and it made like a V formation, and it bounced back out into space. He said that was the first one, then there were two after that, in rapid succession, and then three, and it kept going all the way up until they did nine of these, and he said it was like they were flying a pattern, like a squadron was coming in and flying a pattern, and they wanted him to see this. He's he's never written about this or spoke about this either. Going back Uh, to the Valiant Thor story. Yeah, let me me read our... uh a little bit about this story to our our audience here, and then and you can tell sure. me uh, more sure. about it. Uh, it's it's a very interesting. Um, the story of Valiant Thor began back in 1957. He was uh, by the pictures that we have a very handsome man. It could have been a movie star. Uh, didn't just had it all. Uh, perfectly, you know, great face. He was uh, a man who visited the Eisenhower administration as well. He seemed quite normal, except that he was said to have no fingerprints and was able to see through walls. It was said that he was a Venusian, and he had landed his ship near Lake Mead in the Las Vegas area. Area 51, S4. The ship was referred to as the Victory One. Valiant claimed he was the leader of all Venusians who were on Earth, walking amongst us, and he spoke in a dialect unlike any other known on the planet. He reported that his race of people lived within Venus, inside the planet, not on the surface, which is most inhospitable, that they were very attractive, intelligent, less violent than mankind, and he said... They were sent here to protect man from himself, including including nuclear devastation. According to Thor, he did not meet the president, but did meet with his secretary of state, Dulles. A man named Frank Strangest then came forward, saying that uh, he had met with Thor and his brother, and his brother could walk through walls. Uh, he said that he often traveled with them and others through space, and uh, then the story got uh, stranger from that. But Frank Stranges is another character in this uh, Valiant Thor epic. Tell us, tell us more. Well, Doctor Frank Stranges was a minister. He also did some work in the military uh, and military intelligence. And um, photographs that were taken of Valiant Thor were taken behind the home of Howard Menger in Highbridge, New Jersey, in 1958. 
It was a series of black and white and color photographs taken by August C. Roberts. And August Roberts was a photographer during the Second World War, and Dr. Stranges was also a, a, a biblical scholar, and he would go around doing uh, lectures and talk about life, the possibility of life existing on other planets. Uh-huh. Well, after one of his lectures, uh, August Roberts presented these photographs to Dr. Stranges and said, these are pictures of a being who claims to be from Venus, whose name he said is Valiant Thor, uh-huh. and he and his brother and the space lady met at Howard Menger's house, and I was there, and I took these photographs. So thereafter, every time Dr. Stranges would lecture, he would show these photographs, and he said these are photographs reported of a being who's visiting Earth from Venus. Well, he was doing a lecture in Washington, D.C., and this was in 1959. And uh, at the end of the lecture, people were crowding around him, asking him questions, and a woman approached him, and said, uh, Dr. Stranges, I need to talk to you immediately. And Dr. Stranges said, well, I'm with some people right now. Can you wait? And she said, no, I must talk to you immediately. So he excused himself from the other people, and he went into the uh, office, and she said, the photograph of the person that you're showing is asking to meet with you. And she said, I have an um, assignment to bring you to the Pentagon. Tomorrow morning I'm going to pick you up at o'clock, 8 o'clock, and you're going to be meeting this individual. And he said, well, I don't have any clearance to get into the Pentagon. He said, don't worry about it. She said, just follow what I tell you, and you'll gain access. So the next thing, she picked him up. She happened to have FBI credentials. So she was with the FBI, Uh and she said, I will pick you up tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, and I will take you to meet the individual who you're showing the photo of. She didn't call him by name. She just said, the individual in the photograph that you're showing people. So she picked him up at 8 o'clock, and he didn't have any security. She had a security badge that she wore around her neck, and it was um, like over her right breast. So he said, I don't have any security clearance. She said, you do exactly what I do when we go through the security checkpoint. You won't have any issues. So when she passed through the first checkpoint, she opened up her her coat and showed the right side of her her dress, which was where her security uh, clearance was. Uh And she walked through, and then he opened his jacket. He didn't have anything there, and they waved him through, and he couldn't believe it. And she says, "You got two more to go through." So they went through two more, and he brought it. To, they brought. She brought him to the inner ring of the Pentagon, uh, and they were up by the uh, double door, wood door. And she said, "The person who wants to meet you is in there." And he opens the door, and he says to her, "Are you coming?" And she says, "No, I was not asked." He goes inside, and on the right hand side are the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And across the room, Jeff, All of them? is a bank of windows, a bank of windows looking out into the courtyard of the Pentagon. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a person standing there wearing a suit, and he turns around and starts walking to, to Dr. Frank and extends his hand. He says, Dr. Stranges, it's very nice to meet you. And he said, my name is Valiant Thor. So he, he shook hands with him, and he looked mm-hmm. down, and he noticed that this person didn't have any palm prints or any fingerprints. And totally he smooth. thought to himself, mm-hmm. for smooth, smooth as a baby. He said, mm-hmm. smooth as a baby. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, how come you don't have any marks on your hands? And uh, Valiant said to him, palm prints and fingerprints are the mark of mankind. We do not have that. Mm. And Dr. Strange just said, well, what do you mean you don't have that? And he said, we never stopped walking with the Lord. And He said what? That really he said, we never stopped walking with the Lord. And it completely took Dr. Strange's eyes to pride. Stop walking, walking with, with the Lord. Lord. Uh, right. So that began a relationship that Dr. Strange had with Valiant Thor. Valiant landed in Alexandria, Virginia in 1957. I believe it was in February of 57. And was a guest at the Pentagon for three years until 1960. And he offered to bring solutions for over- overcoming a disease and poverty and bringing uh, yeah. um, ideas for agriculture, for uh, more efficient engineering of, of uh, devices to well, work could in harmony with it liberated the world from the hands of the, uh, the moguls and ghouls who run it, uh, and the, the petroleum stranglehold and all the rest of it. Uh, he wanted to turn us loose into reality. Yep. And he li- you say and he was a guest of the Pentagon for three years. Does that mean he was three years. staying in the Pentagon? He was staying in the Pentagon, and he would tell Dr. Strangis, he said it was so funny, they would put him in his quarters, and they would lock the door, 
but he had the ability of being able to get out. Oh, yeah. So they could never contain him. They couldn't contain him. And he told Dr. Strangers that every time he tried to talk to them about the benefits that they were bringing as gifts for mankind here, yeah. all they wanted to know was how his ship operated, how his suit was able to repel uh, laser beams, and how was able same to old, repel... Same old. They want military old use. It's all military. Yeah. Military so first. So he told Dr. Strangers mm -hmm. that they, he was here for a, a four-phase program. The first phase was to contact all world leaders, let them know of the existence of beings from other planets here. Yes, so yes. they would come forward and announce us. Well, that failed. The second phase was approaching religious leaders from all the world religions and introducing themselves to them. And Dr. Strangers said, Val, what did they say about that? And he said, they basically said, you paddle your canoe, we'll paddle ours. Uh. <laughs> third phase, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it's fascinating. The third phase was to contact all of the um, uh, universities and colleges of of of, um, of 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 merit and worth, and introduce themselves and ask them to come forward with this information. And then we'll forward with it. So the fourth phase, and what they've been involved in ever since, is a grassroots movement to uh, raise public awareness and public consciousness mm -hmm. because it's not coming through official channels. Mm -hmm. 